The world is a beautiful but challenging place to live. And let's face it, life hits hard sometimes. So if you find your hopes and dreams and mental well-being needs a boost, you're tuned in to the right podcast. Welcome to Inspire Us with your host, Jay Paul Nadeau, a former hostage negotiator turned motivational speaker and acclaimed author of Take Control of Your Life. And now, here's your host, Jay Paul Nadeau. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 29 of Inspire Us. You ever met somebody for the first time and you, for some reason, didn't think you were going to like that person? Well, my next guest was such a person. When I first met him, I didn't like him. <laughs> like That's a terrible thing for me to say. It's an awful thing for anybody to say. To judge someone without getting to know them is just awful. And I slapped my hand for it. Bad Paul. I did that. But boy, was I ever wrong about this man. He is such a good person. And his life philosophy is so rich and so amazing. We've become very good friends. And it is with pleasure that I am going to share this podcast with you. He is up and coming actor, someone who is so committed to the craft, someone who knows what he wants out of life, and he's happy with where he is. And his lessons today are going to bring so much rich value to your life. I have no doubt about that. And I won't even get into it, but amazing man, amazing life philosophies. And if you are into meditation, you're absolutely going to love this episode. And if you're not, you may start meditating after this. It looks like I'm going on a 10-day meditation retreat. When we're back to being able to do that again, I actually look forward to it. So without any further delay, I want to introduce you to my good friend, Eric Hicks. Hi, Eric. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> good, to, good to be here with you again, Paul. Oh, man, it's so good to see you. It's been a while, and I've been following your career. Very outstanding. Way to go. I, you know what? I remember when I first met you, and it was at a Meisner class, and I didn't like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, well, you know, let me put it this way. I think I made the error in judgment of looking at you and kind of trying to figure you out. And I don't think it was until the second or third class that I had met you that I saw your passion, your complete dedication to this craft. And then I, I liked you and I respected you. And we ended up doing a, an exercise together, if you remember that. Yeah. And, and I connected with you on on such a, a level back then. And I think we both felt it. That was a real connecting moment between two people. And of course, that original opinion of you, which was wrong to form from the very beginning, because we should never do that, changed immediately and, <laughs> and, and permanently. And you've become a very good friend. So that's what connections are all about. So I want to ask you a little bit about your past. How did you get into the profession? Where, where were you born? Where were you raised? What were your influences in life? You know, first off on what you said, I was like, you know, it's so funny. It's like first impressions with a lot of people when they first see me, I'm a very naturally flirty guy. And I have this like this look of like old white money, which is just like this little, little bit of an arrogant kind of look. So a lot of people, when they first see me, they're like, oh, this guy's so full of himself. And, you know, that's always the first impression until people get to know me. And then they're like, oh, okay, I, I understand you. It's like your shell is, it's a misnomer for what's really truly behind the screen. But uh, the one thing, like, it's, it's because I look a certain way, but I come from a small town grounded, rooted community in Saskatchewan, Canada, a small town called Lumsden, and it's 1,500 people. It's down in the bottom of a Capel Valley. So if you even think of just the, the imagery of that, it's a very sheltered and protected space. It's protected not only from, you know, crime, and it's protected from the winds of the flatlands above. And so it's, you know, having a childhood where you're growing up in this really safe, supported community you develop a, a, a certain 
belief that you're, I don't know, you're just filled with so much love that you know that whatever you do in life, it's perfect. You're enough. And so my whole childhood, you know, my great, great, great grandparents started the town I grew up in. Oh. They, they, they had the general store during the dirty 30s when everyone was broke and they couldn't afford food. They just gave IOUs that were never repaid and, and helped the community because that's the town I grew up in. It's, you know, grandparents, parents, everyone was situated there. So I have all my cousins and uncles and aunts and relatives all throughout that community. And so it's very supportive. My uncle was the mayor of the town and also my history teacher. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's a very tight knit community. We didn't lock our doors at night. So you could imagine growing up in a town of this type of support and trust, you have a very naive perspective on the world because that's all I knew. We didn't, we had one channel on TV. We didn't watch the news. We didn't, you know. And so when it came to leaving my small town after graduation, um, I went out to BC for prosthetics and orthotics to go to school for that. And the way I got introduced to that career path is my dad was an orthopedic shoemaker and he worked in the prosthetics and orthotics department in Regina, the, the city about 15 minutes away. And so I go into work and I would see these people doing prosthetics and orthotics. And I was like, what a fascinating job. You know, it's, it has kind of elements of everything that I, I enjoy and I'm good at, you know, social work. It has your, you know, anatomy, physiology, your physics, hands on building, crafting, sculpting, artistic, you know, and it's, you know, gait analysis, kinesiology, kinetics, it's just got a little bit of everything in it. And so when I chose that path, it seemed like that's what I was destined to do. And when I, when I was in school for it, I was eating it up, I was learning and it just an accelerated rate, learning so fast. And when I was doing my internship to get certified for prosthetics, it just got to this point where it became too easy for me. Mm. And then it became just almost repetitive actions. Like I could see the next 35 years of my life and it wasn't a challenge anymore. It was like, there was no more purpose, no more, nowhere higher to aim. And that to me just kind of took the wind out of my sail. And so I remember the day I got certified, it was just like, it was, instead of being an elation, it was an elation for a second. And then right after it was like, wow, like this is my life. This is, I can see everything. And so about a year before that happened, I had taken it upon myself to, pursue a path. I was almost looking for something else. I was going to University of Regina at, for night classes and weekend classes to get a degree in visit men. I was part of a cheerleading team, a competitive national cheerleading team. I was doing triathlons. Um, like I was just filling my schedule with nonstop back to back things. And then an opportunity arose for modeling. And that inadvertently opened a door to do an acting competition in the Canadian Model and Talent Convention in Mississauga. And so I was only supposed to go for modeling, but I said, you know what, just for shits and giggles, let's do the acting portion of it. And so I, I read, I bought a book, how to, how to, what is it? Acting for dummies. <laughs> okay. And I was like, you know, you know, oddly enough, that book is like, it lists the industry like in pretty great detail. I was like, okay, I have a good idea of what, what I'm expecting now. And I went in that competition, just giving it my everything. And I won that. And that opened the doors of a bunch of agents saying, Hey, come move to our city and we'll sign you. And so it was, that was, that happened maybe two months, a month or two months before I got certified. And so the second I got certified, that's why it was an elation and then almost like a depression where it was like, it wasn't a depression, but it was just a, well, I have this other thing out the window. And within, I think it was maybe one or two days. I didn't even hesitate. I gave my one month notice resignation at work for prosthetics. And I said, you know what? Let's, you only get one life. You might as well do something that's really going to challenge you and that you're really going to enjoy. And I knew to my personality, I need to be challenged. And I wasn't being challenged anymore. And so I said, let's do this. But if we're going to do this, if we're going to drop this prosthetics and orthotics career, 
and we're going to pursue acting, we're going to treat it that same way as a business, as a career choice. And so I got to give it everything I possibly got. And I have to be willing to persist through the highs and the lows, because I know that there's going to be a lot of lows. It's, you know, you listen to anyone who's done it before. It's a long, long journey and with a lot of struggle and the money, it's not a money making industry. And so, you know, that was something I was raised to do to make money. And mm -hmm. so I had to kind of rewash my brain that it's about the passion. It's about the art. It's not about the money. The money will come and go. It, it's just a tool. It, and money means nothing. And so you just got to do what you want to do. And so I was like, screw it. And so I got a job at Moxie's in Regina serving just part-time shifts. And because I knew I was going to have to get a serving job out there. I looked into getting a prosthetics job, but they wanted 70 hours a week. And I was like, well, I can't do that and acting. And so when I moved out to Toronto, I didn't, I chose Toronto because I had done Vancouver already and I wanted to stay in Canada. And when I chose, when I moved to Toronto, I didn't know anybody. And that was kind of nerve wracking and exciting, but that's where you grow the most when you're in those uncomfortable states of being. And so I just threw myself into Toronto and not having a clue of what the heck I was going to do. I went up to a Moxie's there, got a job. And then I just started talking to people, reaching out, uh, started community theater, singing classes, dancing classes, uh, improv classes, on camera acting classes. And I just started, I was like, should I go to theater school? I don't know. And so it's this whole, you know, you just kind of carve your own path and it just, organically happens on its own but there's no wrong way to go it's like whatever way you go is the right way but mm -hmm. you just got to be content with whatever way you, you choose to go you really do and you hit on so many really important things a lot of our actors and actresses out there are struggling with where they're going to go from here mm -hmm. and what i've heard from you number one is that you're a risk taker and you you don't mind trying something new and not only don't you mind trying it what I've heard from you, Eric, is that you put 150,000% into what you do. And to leave a stable career because your heart told you that that was not for you, your artistic part of you came out and you said, this is going to be my career and I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to make it move forward. And that is remarkable because a lot of people don't follow their heart and they stay stuck can you imagine yourself right now and i don't think you probably could if you had stayed with your earlier career where would you be right now i i actually thought about that just a week ago maybe and i was like because the the path i had carved out for prosthetics and orthotics is i would get certified in prosthetics by 22 i would get certified in orthotics by 24 so i'd be dual certified i would have my my business degree and with night and weekend classes which was going to take me seven years so that means I started at 20, I would have been 27. I would have been dual certified with a, a, an extra degree in business admin. And then I would have moved down to the States and opened up my own shop because that's where the money was to be made. And so I would be running my own shop seven years, six, seven years in down in the States, you know, all about money, putting in about 70, 70 to 80 hours a week. I would have a family. I would have a cottage, I would have cars, all this materialism, but I wouldn't have that spiritual know-how, that spiritual insight that I've learned as an artist, these invaluable, deep-rooted set of wisdom where you know what is, you know, beyond this materialistic 3D world. And you know, you know, these are the lessons that you learn as an artist, these beautiful gifts of where you have to dig inside yourself and mm -hmm. learn to love yourself. And that's, that's hard work. That takes deep, 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 insightful work, a lot of dedication. But that's the beauty of being an artist is you get to do that work. That's your job. But right. as a prosthetist, I wouldn't have been doing that work. And so I would have been living a very much regular lifestyle where you just work your life away. You have a wife, you have kids, you have all these materialistic toys, and then you have a midlife crisis and you, you, you wonder what the hell you did all that for, mm. you know, and, and then you, you figured out later in life, but I was lucky enough to have had, you know, parents who supported me in whatever I did. And they said, Hey man, whatever you want to do, we know that you can do whatever you want to do. We have full faith in you. 
and and they supported me in that way never financially it was always on my own right so it's like you had to take responsibility for your own path there was no backup plan there was no security blanket no anything like that so it's like but you know what paul there was one thing when i moved out to toronto I said to myself, because money is always something you're brainwashed about when you're young. And I said to myself, I wonder what it'd be like to be broke. And I had 40 some thousand dollars saved up from prosthetics already at that point. And I just invested all that money in taking acting classes and working as few shifts as possible. And I just allowed myself to wean through those savings till I got down to $80. And I was like, well, how about that? I was like, I'm still alive and I have no money. And I went on welfare, social security for a year, just so I could study acting the full time. You know, just, I was like, that's how committed I was. I was willing to go on welfare just so I could focus on acting, just to prove to myself that money isn't going to make me whole. Money's not going to kill me. If I don't have it, I'm not going to die. I'm like, and it's this whole concept of how we put all of our attachment on money, 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 the acquiring of money. And then when you lose that money, you go into a depression. A lot of people commit suicide. And I'm like, so I got to learn that lesson at a young enough age that I'm like, even if I have no money, it's fine. Everything is perfectly fine. You take away that power that money has over you. And then you can truly just live for what you want to live for. And that's exactly what you've been saying, too. You're right. We are conditioned to believe that money is the answer to so many of our problems, when in fact, it creates many of our problems. And your vision of being this uh, this one career and living a nine to five or, well, 70 hour uh, a week job and having maybe weekends to yourself, maybe, and one holiday a year uh, certainly didn't ignite that passion and that artistic inside of you, that artistic person inside of you, right? Yeah. So having said that, were there times that you felt that you wanted to give up or was your mindset such, and, and I think I already know the answer to this having listened to you for just a few minutes now, uh, was your mindset such that it didn't matter what came your way, you were going to get through it and you were going to accomplish what it is that you set out to do, your purpose? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Everyone has their doubts. Mm -hmm. It's a human condition. So certain moments, it gets hard, man. It, the struggle is real. And those are just lessons. Those are challenges. Try t testing your patience. And so I have a mantra, just patience and persistence and so every time i'm at that point where i'm like you know what man this is just this is so freaking hard I'm, I'm ready to give up it doesn't take long it takes about 30 seconds and then my i catch those thoughts and i say ah i'm like isn't that funny my thoughts are trying to sabotage me and then what i do is i just remember a certain moment of when you've given a performance that has really affected people and really meant something and it's magical, I'm like, you can do this and you can do this very, very well. You just have to keep at it. Just keep, don't stop. Just put your heart into it. Don't stop. Don't lose that passion. But I can't tell you, man, probably 30 times I've had that doubt, mm -hmm. but then I just catch it and I stop it right away. Because if you, if you don't stop it right away, it's just going to roll. And so one of the, I'm going to, actually, this is a good point. And this is something that a lot of people are going through with COVID. When I made up my mind that I was going to be a full-time working actor, I had just gone back to a serving job and I was still non-union. And Right at that last day, I got fired from this job because I had, there was a table that had some complaints on some food and I didn't offer to compensate them for the food because they didn't mention or bring it up, which I should have. And the owner or the GM, um, he said, uh, we got to let you go. And he's like, I have the, the, whatever, the complaint you can read if you want. I'm like, no, no, I understand. That's perfectly fine. And I just accepted it with grace. Because in my mind, I had made up that I was going to be full-time working actor. Right after that, I booked my first ever acting gig. And then right after that, it's bang, 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 bang. And it just started taking off. But the one thing when I became a full-time working actor is now you have a lot of free time on your hands. 
And that is something that I had never had to deal with in my life is having a lot of free time to just do whatever you want to do day in and day out. And there's no one, no structure from a schooling system, no structure from a job you have to show up to. It's literally you as a creative artist get to do whatever you want. And so you have to hold yourself accountable day after day to whatever you do. And there was like a six month learning curve to being content in that type of environment, that type of headspace. And when this COVID shutdown came around, I couldn't help but think this is exactly what everyone is going through. What I went through, you know, five and a half years ago is you have to learn. It's, a, it's something you got to go through and learn how to do. What do you do when you have nothing to do? No schedule, no, uh, you know, everything shut down. You have all the time in the world. What are you going to do? And I'm like, that's where you really start to learn a lot about yourself. Because now you got to spend a lot of time with yourself <laughs> without any escape. And so that, I think, was one of the most important lessons I've had in my life is how to be content and how to be happy in the silence of the downtimes. When there's nothing going on, how do you stay happy? And that's where meditation comes in. And that's something that I really think for actors is one of the most essential beneficial things you could ever give yourself is, and I did a 10 day Vipassana silent meditation retreat where they teach you how to meditate, but it takes 10 full days to learn how to meditate. And I can't tell you, it's the greatest gift I ever gave myself in my life. And I, I try to do it every morning for an hour and it just resets it. It shuts off your mind and it cleanses everything out. And then you're just there, mm -hmm. you're just here. And you can see clearly your mind is unclouded and you're content with nothing, with just yourself. And there's a certain self love there. And when you love yourself, then you're not needing that love from other people. You know, so it's just, it's just this whole cycle, but it's like valuable lessons during this COVID timing. And so I think this has actually been a really good thing for our planet and for people. You know, they're going to have to learn to all these things that have been pent up are now coming to the surface and you got to deal with that now. You do. And what you said is very, very profound on so many different levels. The internal uh, monologue or dialogue that you had with yourself during those 30 times of doubt was immediately uh, taken prisoner. So those hostage takers, you actually yes. took them hostage and said, get <laughs> the hell right. out of here, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. And that really comes down to beliefs, the beliefs that you've been instilling within yourself and learning and experiencing. And then you have, you figure the consequence. If I stay with this, with this line of thinking that things are not going to get any better, then you, you bring yourself to a low point. But that's not what you did. You saw the consequences and you said, that's not what I want. And you moved forward. So a lot of our listeners could learn so much from this passage that you just gave us about handling that internal monologue and working on yourself for this time in our lives. So that's really profound. You must have done a lot of studying and going deep down into your soul to see who you wanted to be the best version of you, right? Well, it all, you know, my life, it began, I was always a curious guy. I've always been a very, very curious guy. And so my parents had me, they got me into reading from like, I mean, a very young age. I remember every year at school, they had an award, like a, a book reading award, who could read the, who read the most books. And it was always, you know, by, by dozens of books, I would take the lead. And I just loved reading. And so my whole life, like I got, I got the governor general's medal of honor in high school for the highest grades. And I've just been an avid learner my whole life. And so the acquisition of knowledge was always a high priority in my life. But then what happened is when that knowledge, you know, you, you feel like you start to learn the most of what knowledge can teach you. And then there is an avenue where spirituality came into my life. And I was like, what is this whole hippy dippy kind of thing? I'm like, I see these hippies out there. I see these meditators, these, and I didn't know a lot about it. I'd taken a psychology class in university and this teacher taught us just like a 20 minute, follow your breath in and out for 20 minutes kind of meditation. And I would go into this kind of like lucid dreamlike state. 
And, you know, that was me getting almost carried away in my ego mind. And I didn't know what it was. It's like, there's, but I knew I was like, there's something here, but I don't know what it is. And that technique only allowed me to go so far with it. But I actually started working with like psychedelics, magic mushrooms. And I was reading at the same time, all these spiritual books, watching documentaries, and it was still at that stage of knowledge. But then what happened is I started to have these experiences, you know, through a deep, deep meditation and as well through psychedelic uh, ceremonies. And these two things together worked hand in hand to essentially turn all of that theoretical knowledge into experiential knowledge. And then that experiential knowledge is what I call wisdom. When you've experienced something and know that thing to that degree to be true, then that knowledge now becomes experiential knowledge. It's wisdom, something you know to be true, something you can share and pass on. That is something that now when I read any type of spiritual book, any type of book from the Buddha, from you know the, the Tao, the Ching, all these books, they speak these universal truths. And through these experiences where I've gone to the darkest parts of my soul, where I've accepted my own death and died what you call an ego death, and you get taken to the other side and reveal this connectedness to the source of everything. When you experience this, then all of this materialistic 3D world becomes so, you know, flittery. Mm -hmm. It's just all an illusion. And so when you know the truth of what, when you experience that truth, then all these spiritual books I read, I'm like, I know that to be true. I, 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 I've been, it's been revealed to me the exact same things that all the greatest spiritual teachers teach. And it's through these experiences that they have had that they're able to teach these things. And so these, not many people get to learn this stuff in their lifetime, but this is the kind of stuff that is available to everyone who is searching for it or who is open to letting go of control and having that revealed to you. But it, it was a long process and a lot of deep work. But when you start to learn that type of thing, then, you know, life is a lot easier mm -hmm. because you understand what is and what isn't. And you're able to accept what is. You're ex able to accept whatever is as it is. And there's such a power in that to just letting go of that need for more, the need for control, the need for power, the need for this and that. You just let go and you're content with whatever is. Isn't that what we should all be aspiring to do is to get connected with ourselves and the truth because what you've gone through, all this uh, studying and all these uh, these meditations that you've done and uh, the people that you followed, and you've shared a couple of videos on social media uh, saying, hey, you should watch this. And I have, and they were profound and they were deep. And I believe that by doing that, you actually discover how you can deal with adversity and setbacks by responding positively as opposed to negatively. And that's what you're talking about, right? You're talking about choosing your responses based on your teachings, on a, many teachings of the wonderful people that have come and shared this expert knowledge. It, that is, that's profound. And I think a lot of people need to do that. Uh, what you're saying is really releasing those expectations that the world have and getting back into your heart, your desire, your passions. You've come a long way in your life and I enjoy watching uh, your, your work and I enjoy listening to what you have to say. And especially in these areas where people today could learn so much from what you have to say and for, from what other people have to say, what would you, what kind of information would you impart a knowledge, wisdom, on the actors uh, that are struggling today? Uh, what would you tell them? There's certain things like right now, there's big change happening. You don't wanna fight change. You'll never win. Change is gonna happen. So you might as well join the change, embrace it, support it, you know, get on board with it. That's I think the biggest thing, because I hear a lot of actors these days and they're holding grievances and they're feeling left out. And 
it's the wrong it's the wrong way to go about it because it comes from an individual you feel like you're lacking you don't have enough and it's that that type of mentality comes from not being grateful for what you have but always wanting more and so i think just to check yourself and just to to really find that true deep gratitude for what you have right now is the most meaningful thing you can do for your acting career because then you're not coming in holding grudges. You're not coming in with a desperation or a neediness or a needing to prove yourself to someone or others or the world or whatever it is. You can just come in because you're truly doing what you want to be doing, which is the art. Mm -hmm. And if you can get to that point where you're just doing the art for art's sake, for exploration, for fun, because you enjoy it. If you can get to that state, you don't need to worry about anything else. It's just going to do its own thing on its own in its own timing. But yet, like the biggest thing I say is patience and persistence. Mm -hmm. but you have to be patient. It's it's just a part of the industry. It's going to you can go years without working. That's nothing against you. It's just the right project hasn't come up where you're that perfect fit for that vehicle. It will come. But keep training. Keep practicing that passion because you do get better at what you practice so the more you do it the better you're going to get it's as simple as that put in the hours just practice just keep doing it don't stop and it will come around so be patient and be persistent very persistent keep at it that's a great mantra to have because it applies in every aspect of our lives does it not yeah absolutely it it, it, uh, it is really following your passion your heart your desire to be creative, to have fun. And a lot of people forget it, it, life can be fun if, if we give ourselves <laughs> yeah. permission, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. We, you know what? Give ourselves permission. And you've, you've touched on so many things, Eric. Uh, just uh, your, your willpower, your, your commitment, your determination, and even finding yourself in a quiet spot like we all are right now. It's all right to be there as long as you are filling your time with something productive and, and maybe going into your meditation mind and doing yes. something that is creative, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where do you see yourself going from here? Like, uh, I, I know that you've had, and I just want to tell our, our listeners, uh, for those of you who have not checked Eric out yet, he's been on several very, very significant shows. It's been The Strain. Uh, you've been on Schitt's Creek, you've been on Cardinal, you've been on Bad Blood and Rain and a bunch of other things. You've got a couple of movies out right now, which is great. So you're really following your heart and doing very, very well. And kudos to you. Way to go. And I, I believe that you're there because of everything that you've put into it, which is a big lesson. You don't get what you don't put into, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and I mean, for the people like I, I, I remember the first post I ever made about you know, really booking work. And it was, it was a pretty emotional experience for me, because a lot of people didn't know, you don't know other people's journeys and the struggles they go through, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they enter this industry, and they they book their first job within a year, two years, they, they book a job, and they're like, Oh, this ain't so bad. Well, for me, it was seven and a half years. And so it was seven and a half years of auditioning and never booking a job. And you know, I didn't give up. And that's the thing is I just kept training throughout that whole time. And when I started booking, I started booking, like I started booking because I was so well prepared to start booking. But a lot of people, you know, they didn't know my story. And so I shared that journey with a lot of people. And it really blew a lot of people's minds that someone was able to go without any booking for, you know, seven, seven and a half years and stay with it and then people are like you know what we're really happy for you that you, you you're booking because they knew what it took to get to that point it was well deserved a sacrifice almost and it's like but that doesn't matter what other people think the point is is like your achievements and your success are in equal proportion to the amount of sacrifice it took to get there the more you give the more you struggle the more you work the more you put into something when you finally achieve that thing it just means a thousand times more than if you just showed up one day and bam hey here it is you can have this and it's so easy for you that's like prosthetics and orthotics for me 
it came so darn easy for me that, you know, it didn't really mean anything to me. It was too easy. It, it was, it was organic for me. It was too easy. And so I was like, it didn't mean, it just didn't mean a lot. And that's why I was able to let go of it so easy and move on to something that I really truly cared about and was passionate about. And so that's, that, that's a big thing, you know, just understand that all of these years of hustle that you're going through as an actor, where you're training and you're not booking, you feel like you're not making progress. You feel like the casting directors aren't seeing you. Uh, for the first seven years, I was maybe only getting two, three auditions a year. Like I, I wasn't even getting the auditions, a lot of commercial auditions, but not a lot of TV film auditions. So like I was doing a lot of non-union stuff, mind you, I was doing auditioning all for all the non-union world stuff. That's a different ball game, mm -hmm. but you know, you have these certain thoughts and my best friend was a tall handsome model guy and he was getting all the auditions and getting all the bookings and we self tape together and so i'm i'm doing all the training he wasn't taking classes and he's getting all the bookings and all the auditions and i'm like it's very easy in that situation to get embittered because you see that the industry isn't fair but i was like you know what it, it, it's easy to get brought down by something like that but i was like i just you have to remind yourself time and again it's just like learning an instrument the more hours you put into something the better you're going to get at it and so i just i just kept at it and then in time that paid off and so i've always said you have to invest in yourself really truly invest in yourself and trust that that will pay off down the road and there was a lot of temptation in that whole process a lot of my other actor friends they would just work all the time and they would save up money and they would invest in properties and stuff like that but i'm like well while you're doing that that's great but i'm like you're not investing in your acting career and so i'm like how bad do you want it if you're not investing that deeply in your acting career then someone else is and they're probably going to get a little bit more nuanced a little few more you know something like that so it's like you just got to figure out your priorities but the more hours the more time you put into something the better you're going to get at it and so that's just be patient and be persistent and it will work out it absolutely will work out and you have to know that to be true you're right and uh, i love what you said about uh, how bad do you want it when we don't want something bad enough we tend to drop it it's not it's not on our minds to achieve that that badly so we can get distracted very easily. And you really sound like the uh, Canadian Matthew McConaughey, my friend. You're, uh, <laughs> you're the Canadian uh, Matthew McConaughey. Your wisdom and, and your drive, such valuable lessons for all our listeners out there, not only the actors, but people in their lives who are finding themselves in a situation where they have to make a career change. You've, you've talked about that follow your heart, follow your passion. Imagine what it's going to be like 10 or 15 or 20 years uh, from now if you don't take immediate action to do what it is that you love and to put 150,000% into it, which is what you did. Yeah, there's an author, I read his three books just last year, um, Yuval Noah Harari, he's a Jewish historian and he wrote, uh, which a lot of people have heard of, Sapiens. Yes, I got it. Yeah, that was about the past, Homo Deus, which is about, you know, uh, the future and then or, or the present day and then 21 lessons or the future and then 21 lessons for the 21st century which is what you need to know now and in that one of the biggest lessons he says is that in this century you're going to have to change careers every 10 years that is that is a truth like you will be having to change your career every 10 years mm -hmm. and so the ability to adapt to change is one of the most useful skills you'll ever give yourself. So right now during COVID, this is just a testing tool for the next you know, century. You're gonna have to learn how to adapt to change because careers will change rapidly, very fast. And you're gonna have to learn, to learn new skill sets and learn how to change and go with the flow of things. And the other thing that he says at the very end of that book is Vipassana meditation is the hope for our future that's that's the that's the last chapter and i i have to agree with him fully it really is if if we as a society and as a species really want to advance ourselves we have to learn to be aware of our egoic minds mm -hmm. and how to control our minds so not to let the mind run off on its own tangents without us being aware of it so that we have power over our own thoughts 
this is one of the keys to uh, happiness, to yeah. endurance, to uh, success, to everything. Yes. Having, yes. Yes. Take, <laughs> hey, you know what? Taking control of your life. Which yes. Is- <laughs> take control of your life. That's right, Paul. Exactly. Wow. Uh, you're oh, such an, a gentleman. <laughs> uh, you know, thank you, sir. And you're such an inspiration, Eric, and you always have. And I, I enjoy our coffee uh, time together and, and uh, our friendship together. You've really, uh, we've had some interesting conversations and this has uh, been absolutely amazing. And, uh, so uh, I, I hope that our listeners listen to this episode two or three times because you have imparted such great uh, wisdom and direction for people that yeah. Your, your life experience is a model for a lot of people. What you've been through, what you told yourself, those arguments you had with yourself that uh, you won over you know, the, the nastiness of your mind um, is a true testament to where you are today. And, how, and you look happy. You look, uh, you look satisfied and you look like you have purpose. Yeah, yeah, like big smile <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> hey, you do, you do. So, and, and I think that that's a valuable lesson for all of us uh, to, to learn because you said things are going to happen. They're going to happen and you can't fight it sometimes. You just have to accept it and you have to work with it. Very valuable for a lot of people who have experienced adversity and setbacks during this particular time of their lives. And um, tell me more about the meditation that you do. I know that you took the 10 day retreat. I almost t- took that one, I never did, but I'm doing meditation. I know, I know, I never did, uh, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm not going to, yes. right? <laughs> it, it, it took me two years to commit to going. I was supposed to go two separate times and I backed out last minute both times because my ego got in the way and it said, it said this is crazy. They're like, what are you doing? You're going to go sit there for 10 days in silence and blah, blah. And my mind sabotaged me. Yes. It tricked me into not going two times. And so it wasn't until two years later that I finally committed to going where I was like, I'm doing this. I don't care what happens. <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm going to do this. And I went and I did it. And when I showed up there, it was all this stress relief because I was like, okay, I'm here. Oh, this is, we're just taking it moment by moment. I'm like, okay, we're just going to, they'll guide me through it. They've been doing this for thousands of years. And I'm like, this is ancient wisdom here. They're passing on. And, and, and the beautiful thing I'm going to tell for the listeners is that it's free. Vipassana meditation, 10 day course. It's completely free. It's by donation. They sustain themselves by donation based amount only. If you have money, you can donate at the end of it all. If you don't, I was on welfare at that time when I went. I, I gave maybe, uh, I don't know, $500 and, or not even like just whatever I had available that I would have spent during that time anyways. And, and that's that. And so there's no excuse not to go, but you got to go. Yeah. So, and, and, and I have to commit to go. Uh, yeah. You got to you- make it up in your mind that you're going to, you're going to do it. Don't get on the wait list because if you're on the wait list, they'll probably call you the night before a lot of people the night before they get cold feet and they back out. And so you'll get, if you're on the wait list, you'll get a call the night before at like 9 PM. It happened to me once. And they're like, can you come for 6 AM tomorrow morning for, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I got to shut off my whole life for 11 days. And I was like, I was like, I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay. A minute later, I call them back. I'm like, you know what? I'm just not not ready. And then I call them back five minutes later. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. Call them back two minutes later. I'm like, I'm just not ready. I can't right now. And it never happened. And I was like, oh, you're dude. Uh, But everything, it's the right time, you know? You're right. Yeah, everything is the right time. And you said that earlier uh, during our conversation too. Everything will happen at the right time for the right reasons. If you have that belief and you have that drive and and, uh, you have that, well, it really comes down to that confidence in yourself and and understanding what your purpose and your mission and your desires are. Uh, tell me about the internal monologue that, that, that finally persuaded you to take the step and to do the meditation. What was that like in your brain? What were you telling yourself? Well, it, it, and this stems back, like I, I've told some people this before, is this is the whole thing about letting your fear uh, control your decisions in life. So I I use the example of when I was in grade seven, me and some friends were going to join the talent show. 
and we didn't really have a gig. We just had a bunch of like obstacle course things. And we we're just going to be a bunch of goofballs on the stage, making a bunch of like falling mistakes and doing a bunch of tricks and just being idiots. And that was going to be our talent. And a day or two before I backed out, I was like, this is so stupid. I was like, everyone's going to like, they're going to be laughing at us, not, you know, for us you know it's like I'm like this is going to be the end of my social life at school <laughs> and so I backed out and then when the talent show came I was in the audience sitting out on the gym floor watching it was hilarious it was the funniest thing ever and I was like why did I back out of that why did I let my fear control that and so that in my life has that reminder in any time that that fear comes up I have to remember to clock that moment in that that's where the lessons are made. You, when you do that thing that you're afraid of, where your fear says, don't do it, this is going to be awful. That's when you have to do it. Yes. And so I let my fear control me that time when they called me the night before. And immediately after, I should have been at that meditation retreat and I'm not going to get into it, but something happened in my life after that, where I was like, something awful. And I was like, that didn't need to happen. I should be, I should have been at the meditation retreat right now. And I was like, what a lesson to be learned. I let my fear win. And then it just slapped me in the face. It really gave me a good slap. And I was like, wow, talk about a wake up call to that reminder. Acknowledge that fear. Mm -hmm. That fear will be there. It will be there somewhere in your mind and it'll, it's very manipulative. Your mind is very tricky. It's very manipulative mm -hmm. and knowing how to manipulate you into doing what it wants, not for what's best for you. And so when that next round came around, I said, I don't care what it is. And it wasn't till a year later, a year, like 13 months later that I actually signed up, but I made sure that I was on that list, not on the wait list. And I made sure that I was prepared a few days before I was focused and I was like, I'm going to do the work. I'm ready to do the work. And I was in a really great place in my life. You don't have to be in a bad place in your life to go do a 10 day meditation retreat. It's a skill that just enhances everything in your life. And so every morning when I meditate now, a lot of people follow a lot of mantras or they follow their breath or they, you know, certain, there's certain ways meditate. This way of meditating is about completely shutting off your mind. And so it's about observing sensations in your body and the tiniest of sensations. And you slowly scan your body in the same pattern over and over again. It very, very slowly. So a full hour, I scan my body once. And you're just observing the tiniest of sensations without judgment. And so you take away the power that the sensations have over you. Because if you think about in your life, when you react to something, you're reacting to a sensation somewhere in your body. And you say, I like this, or I hate this. You like that sensation, or you hate that sensation. Well, if you're able to observe the tiniest of sensations everywhere in your body, without judgment, then they lose their power over you. Mm -hmm. You cut your finger. Isn't that an interesting sensation without judgment? Mm -hmm. You break a knee. Woo! Whoa. Those are interesting sensations. You just observe it. Mm -hmm. You're having a, a migraine. Let me just observe what the sensations are. It's not a negative thing. It's not a positive thing. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so in that hour, thoughts, when you're trying to just, when you're just observing sensations without judgment, thoughts are going to pop up into your mind constantly. You got to catch that thought right as it happens, or else you're going to go on a thought journey. You got to catch that thought, let it go. Go back to observing sensations. More thoughts are going to pop in, catch them, let them go. It usually takes about half an hour to 45 minutes before my mind finally quiets down completely. And in that last 15 minutes, it's like my body becomes energized, like there's like a, a, a an electric current ripping through me that's just like pulsating beautiful golden light everywhere in your body and then when you open your eyes eventually at the end of that it's just you're there your mind is completely quiet and you're just there there's no judgment no anything you're just there 
And then you just get to experience the world with no thoughts. And it's so peaceful and it's so beautiful. And then that day, as you go throughout that day, your mind is going to get flooded with thoughts again. It's going to get influx with all these thoughts and ideas and stuff. And so, you know, I was meditating an hour at night too, but that just became unrealistic for my lifestyle to do two hours a day. So I just, when I wake up in the morning, do some stretching, drink a little lemon water, and then get to my meditation, quiet that mind, zen out. And then you can experience that day with a peace about you. And I think we should all be doing that because if we can experience our days with a, a peace that we started our mornings off with or our days off with, we'd be much better off, especially, well, I, I keep saying, especially now, that's not true. Every, every time, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. I asked you a little bit earlier about where you were headed. Where do you see yourself uh, down the road? Well, and that's the thing is, you know, I try not to live in the future too much, but in, 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 I do have an idea of kind of the thing, but I'm like, I've always said to myself, you know, I always used to pray at night and I'd say, you know, God, give me the strength to learn as much as I can and to use that knowledge to help others as best I can. And so that's always kind of filtering through my life. I'm like, what can I do to help? And, and so my mind is always like, do I go travel parts of the world and, and contribute in any way, learn about cultures, learn about things, learn about ways that I can relate better to the world and help better and, and spread a positive message. And so that's been something that's just been kind of passing through my mind. But, you know, it, 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 I could die tomorrow, Paul, and I would be a happy man. Mm -hmm. I would really, truly be a happy man and I would be content to go. There's, you know, I've lived such a full life. I've got to see all sides of the coin. And I'm like, now it's just about, you know, enjoying the journey all the way through. And it always has been. It's about enjoying the journey. And so there, there's really no pressure to need to achieve some thing, some idea, some concept, some. It's just about truly enjoying day by day in that journey, wherever it goes. And so I, I really try not to get caught up in that whole, I want to win an Oscar. I want to do big movies. I want to do this and that and have all this money and these properties and this. And, and I'm like, that's a trap. Mm -hmm. That's just a trap in itself where you're mm -hmm. trying to satiate yourself with all these materialistic things and ideas and power. And, and I'm like, that's just a trap. And I'm like, to be content with whatever you have at all times, that's the goal. And so it doesn't matter what happens in the future. It doesn't matter what happens. It's just, you got to be content with whatever you have. And I like, yeah, yeah. No, and I yeah. like what you said. You, you talked about gratitude. You talked about uh, what living in the moment pretty much and not really having to plan too much because if, if COVID has taught us anything is that it doesn't matter how much you plan, it can all be taken away from you. Uh, yeah. In a New York second, everything can go. Eric, you are such an inspiring individual, and to have you on this show to inspire us has been absolutely amazing, and it looks like I'm going to have to get you on another show because <laughs> you've got so much to share and so many valuable lessons, and you know, patience and persistence, uh, those mantras that you give yourself are, are truly something that we can embody right now, especially during these very difficult times. And uh, thank you for sharing all your experiences and, and this wisdom with us because it's been an amazing show. Where can people reach out to you or how can they find you? And, and uh, yeah. I just say, if you, if you follow me on Instagram, I, I don't do it that often, but at Eric, E-R-I-C, Sam, S-A-M, Hicks, H-I-C-K-S. If you follow me on there and you message me, I will respond. I respond to all messages as long as they're, you know, appropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know what? It's like I, I have people reach out to me all the time and, and people thanking me for sharing certain things. It's really meant a lot to a lot of people. But if you reach out to me, man, I have people reach out all the time and I respond and I, in any way I can help, I'm, I'm here to help. So. That's the best way to go about it. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. And once again, thank you for coming on this show and sharing all your knowledge and experience and wisdom with us. And uh, you have really inspired us here today. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, man. You're the best, buddy. <laughs> uh, you know what? I can't wait for us to get together again. Yes, after this I know. COVID <laughs> craziness, buddy. Uh, it's good too, though. It's good yeah. to see you. Again. Good to see you too, man. Thanks for having me, Paul.
Thank you. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another insightful episode. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and leave your comments. For more information, check out our website at www.inspireus.ca. Remember, it's not what happens to us that matters most. It's how we respond to what happens to us that does. Stay strong and resilient.